What are some of the most important disorders that you have uncovered? Well, as you noted, some of them are familiar ones to most lesbians. The U-Haul syndrome, the gaydar deficiency disorder, uh, potluck addictions, uh, lesbian bed death. Most of us have heard of that one. Uh, de-diking anxiety disorder, the stress that comes from having visitors to your home uh, to whom you are not out. But there are many, many others that are subtle and up until this time have remained unnamed. Uh, for example, you mentioned the cat and the dog fetishes. Those are well known among lesbian communities. But less is known about the lesbian who can't commit to being a cat lover or a dog lover and instead has a virtual zoo in her house of all sorts of non-human companions. This condition, polyanimalry, is really understudied. Okay, but I mean, what's wrong with loving my cat? Well, nothing is wrong with loving one's cat. A uh, condition only becomes pathological when it interferes with relationships with significant others or family or interferes with one's ability to work. So like the DSM, the DDM conditions are only pathological if they cause problems in one's relationships or communities. And do you prescribe treatments for these severe maladies? I do suggest treatments for most of these conditions. I do have to add the caveat that most of them have not been studied yet. They are more theoretical treatments than they are actually known evidence-based treatments. I believe they're based on sound observations from you know, 30 years of living in lesbian communities. So can you give an example? Like, How would you treat, say, lesbian fusion disorder? Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about the symptoms of lesbian fusion disorders. So this refers to a couple, a triad, or a whole community who melt or merge together into one relatively unified being. Uh, in the heterosexual world, it's, it's rare to find the degree of relationship fusion that exists in many lesbian partnerships. For example, heterosexual couples rarely synchronize their monthly cycles or think of themselves as one unit rather than two separate beings. Heterosexual couples might finish each other's sentences, but fused lesbians may speak whole monologues for each other. Uh, very few heterosexual women will keep their ex-husbands as best friends and confidants, and rarely does a straight man present every potential new girlfriend to be interrogated by his ex-wife before deciding whether to date her. But lesbians do this. So this, this fusion, like nuclear fusion is in nature, can sometimes occur almost instantaneously upon a first meeting. And once fused, a couple's bonds are strong and difficult to break. So fused lesbians then find that they can't give up their ex-lovers no matter how painful their relationship or their breakups were. And actually being fused is no predictor of relationship success. So breakups are as common, maybe more common among fused lesbians. So I wanted to give you just an example of the, you, know, you can have simple lesbian fusion. That's you know when a couple meet and they come together, and you know we all have, have have recognized these couples. They start to talk alike, they start to dress alike, they finish each other's sentences, and they can't be parted. Now this doesn't cause too much trouble until they break up, and then you have ex-lover lesbian fusion disorder, and that's bad enough. But the most common problem is in lesbians who have had multiple relationships that have been fused. And so the most serious version of this condition is called the multiple ex-lover fusion condition. So I want to give a study just to give you an idea what this is like. And just think about how many people you know in your own life who might be like this. So Barb once spent six months of her life in therapy, not for couples therapy to save her relationship, but instead to foster the relationship into ex-lover status with Tracy, a woman with whom she had been fused for four years. Barb's ex once removed Gloria and Gloria's new partner, Joan, as well as Tracy's three past lovers, Anne, Michaela, and Aisha, were all involved in this group therapy. The counselor focused on finding ways for all of the exes to maintain their social and relational ties in spite of jealousies and strong dislikes among some of the extended family members. For example, Anne had given birth to a child while she was with Tracy, whose brother had donated the sperm. Tracy was considered the primary co-parent, even though Anne's current partner, Jackie, was a stay-at-home mom with her daughter. The child, now age six, had the daunting task of learning all the complex family relationships, including having to distinguish between mother, mom, mommy, and ma, as well as a whole community of aunties. A further complication was the complex pet custody arrangements that were made for the dog that Barb and Gloria had adopted together and that Tracy had co-pet parented. 
Barb and Gloria had bred the dog eight years ago and distributed ten puppies to various exes, creating a complex extended pet family as well. So the lesbian therapist in this case had to bring in a dyke paralegal and a vet to help them sort out all the custody and social arrangements, such as what couples got to keep which lesbian brunches and game nights, who could play on what softball team, and who had visitation rights with which of the dogs. The messy ex-lover extended family also had to seek out individual therapists in a tri-state area because it would not be ethical for any one therapist to take on all of these women as clients. In fact, two of the women in the extended X network were therapists, and they had to carefully screen new clients to avoid working with anyone who had a relationship or friendship with any woman in this network. So really, though, it doesn't sound like the therapist really cured or even treated their lesbian fusion syndrome, but just maybe enabled them to go on to the next multi-lesbian fusion situation. Yes, this is true. And I think this is because most therapists have been trained in heterosexual relationships, and they really don't know how to deal with with fusion disorders or really any of the diagnostic categories that I talk about in this book. That's why I have some treatment uh, recommendations at the end of each section. So, for example, uh, for fusion disorders, you know, the mild ones are relatively harmless in the early stages of, of long-term lesbian relationships, although they can be annoying or disconcerting to people in the community because, you know, as you're a friend of someone who goes into one of these relationships, you lose that person for a while. But fusion disorders cause the most damage when the fused couple break up. So in this case, drastic measures are needed to avoid future dyke dramas that might impact your entire extended communities. So I recommend boundary therapy, and uh, lesbian identity restoration camps. So we actually can send lesbians away to regain their sense of autonomy and agency after a breakup uh, with a forced period of no contact with the ex-lover until she learns how to make decisions for herself. Um, Everybody could have their own hours or days at good vibrations so that they won't run into each other, right? That's right. That's right. And then when ex-lovers are ready to start dating again, they should not be allowed to meet the ex uh, until the new couple have had at least six dates. And, you know, typically they're living together by this point anyway. Uh, and that way the ex-lover can't interfere with the new relationship. But there is an exception to this. If this is a dyke who suffers from the U-Haul syndrome, then she needs every ex in her arsenal to keep her from U-Hauling again. And it's okay to, to be involved. Do people U-Haul? Well, maybe we should explain because, you know, I assume that a lot of people listening are dykes or almost everybody who's listening, I assume, knows dykes. But some people might not be as familiar with dyke culture as you and I. You know, can you just explain for the novices who might be tuning in or the men or something what U-Haul syndrome is? You know, I think you can really sum it up in that uh, a joke that's so well known in the lesbian community. What do lesbians take on a second date? A U-Haul. There you go. All right, so the theory is because women have been socialized to emotionally bond quickly, you get two women in a relationship together and they're going to form a a bond and think they're in love uh, much earlier than a heterosexual couple would and start to nest. I think this is one of the reasons there's lots of research on physical health problems among lesbians and back problems is one of the most common. Well, think about the the number of times that people have U-Hauled, packed and unpacked those U-Hauls. I think that really accounts for the those physical health problems that many lesbians have. Yeah, but think about all the lesbian moving companies that are going to get put out of business if everybody goes to reads your book or goes to well-trained dyke therapists and unlearns these damaging behaviors. This is true, although I uh, an idea of a place to put lesbian counseling centers at U-Haul <laughs> Offices, because it's a natural place, you know, to do harm reduction therapies. I love that idea. So are there any of these maladies that you yourself exhibit? Well, I have to admit I was a U-Hauler in my youth, but I think I've been cured of that. I have not uh, had fusion disorders in my relationships, but I have had multiple serial monogamy. Which isn't really a problem, is it? I mean, isn't that kind of like homosexuality or something? Like, okay, so again, it's back to, you know, if, you, if it causes you problems. Uh, and many people like me who are recovering MSMs, 
multiple serial monogamists, I feel a lot of shame and guilt about it because each time we go into a relationship, we say, this is the one. So don't take offense at this, but this sounds kind of funny. And we all know that lesbians don't have a sense of humor. So what's going on with that? Yeah, that's one of the biggest myths about lesbians is that they're entirely serious or they're just angry feminists and they have no sense of humor. But actually, you know, I think lesbians are among the funniest people I've ever met in my life, even when they don't think they're being funny. <laughs> and if we can't laugh at ourselves, I mean, come on, how can we survive in stressful, homophobic sexist society if we can't have a sense of humor about ourselves.